Yeah, that's right. Are you on a speaker? Uh, no. Hello? No, we're not. We're... Yeah, the connection, the psychic, it's very, it's very bad. We have like an echo. Oh, I apologize. Let me go ahead and try again, okay? Okay, okay. How happy were you with the last dance? Were you happy with the series? I thought the documentary was, was really well produced. And it gave sports fans who had never met Michael Jordan a really inside look at what really made him the greatest player of all time. It wasn't, it wasn't simply his jumping ability or his athletic ability. It was really his mind. He, his way he approached the game and competition in general was, was really unique. And it allowed him to maintain level of performance on a very consistent level for all those years, which is truly amazing. Acompáñenos en el canal de YouTube arroba Julio Sánchez Cristo Oficial. Bueno, nos cuenta que el documental para él estuvo muy bien producido, fue una mirada muy bien eh, enfocada de lo que lo hizo a Michael Jordan, el jugador más grande de todos los tiempos, no solo por sus habilidades atléticas, sino también por su mente, por la mentalidad, la manera como abordaba el juego, la competición, que era única para él, dice que eso le permitió mantener un nivel consistente por tantos años. Eh, Ana, manejar celebridades en cualquier disciplina, pues es muy complicado. Y esa es la genialidad de nuestro invitado. En el caso de basquetbolistas de la NBA, ¿cuál es el común denominador del problema más grande que él enfrenta con sus celebridades? Mr. Falk, as you well know, managing celebrities in any sports or in any area is very complicated. And this is perhaps what you're very good at. What would you say is the common denominator or of the problem that you would have with most of your NBA players? That's a really good question. So in, in, the, in the day, if I could use that expression, in the day, I say between 1975 and 1995, we we met all of our clients at the invitation of their college coaches. We didn't re we didn't recruit anyone. Um, we weren't really allowed to recruit, but at the end of the season, the coach would invite us in and give us one hour with the player and his family to to make a, a, a presentation. And what I try to present was our track record, what, how we had performed for other players who was in a very similar situation. So, for example, with Michael Stewart, we met Michael in 1984, At, at, at the, when he decided to leave school and become a pro. And he knew that before he came out, we had worked with James Worthy in 1982. We had worked with, who was the number one pick in the draft. And we worked with Al Wood in 1981, who was the number four pick in the draft. And we worked with Michael O'Cord in 1980, who was the sixth pick in the draft. And And, and these are all players from North Carolina who Michael knew. And he knew the work that we had performed for those players. And that's, that's really what gave the players a comfort level that we were qualified to do a good job for them. Bueno, él nos cuenta que nos dice Julio primero que todo que le parece una muy buena pregunta y nos narra cómo era la manera en que reclutaban a estos jugadores y dice que entre 1975 y 85 pues eh, simplemente los invitaban los entrenadores a las universidades y al final de la temporada los invitaban a que compartieran una hora con el jugador y con su familia para hacer una presentación y la estrategia que ellos utilizaban era mostrar eh, a los jugadores eh, que ellos habían tenido que tenían bastante 
bastante éxito. En 1984, por ejemplo, tenían el caso de Michael Jordan, que dejó el colegio en ese año para convertirse en un jugador profesional y pues todos conocían ese trabajo que él había hecho y pues lo famoso que era. Y posteriormente con él, o anteriormente con él, hizo precisamente lo mismo. Le mostró todos esos pues jugadores muy famosos y muy reconocidos de Carolina del Norte que conocía muy bien eh, Michael Jordan y eso le daba a los jugadores cierto sentido de confianza para que se fueran a trabajar con él. El señor Falk, eh, como decía Julio en la presentación, fue quien se inventó básicamente las Air Jordan. Para sus zapatos Michael Jordan quería trabajar con Adidas, pero él fue quien lo convenció a través de su mamá de hacerlo con Nike. ¿Por qué? Cuando en el documental se muestra que Jordan era muy cercano a su papá, él decide decirle a la mamá cómo fue esa negociación, cómo fue todo el proceso de la serie Jordan. Mr. Falk, um, as we, I mean, you were the person behind Air Jordan. We are under the understanding that at the beginning Michael Jordan wanted to work with Adidas, and you were the one person that said let's do it with Nike, and you did this through his mother. But at the time, Michael was very close to his father. Why did you decide to go through his mother, and how was this whole process of getting him to work with Nike? <coughs> First of all, Michael came from an amazing family. His parents were extremely hardworking people, and they constantly pushed him to, work, to grow. As, uh, they, they pushed him to do well in school, you know, to not let his best go to they were, they were great role models. Uh, Michael, as everyone knows, had a preference wearing Adidas shoes. And our company had a very close relationship with Adidas. We had, we had represented Stan Smith, who's got one of the most successful shoes of all time. We represented a lot of tennis players um, who, were with, who were with Adidas. Um, but the owner of Adidas had died before Michael went pro. And the company really wasn't in a position To, um, to execute the kind of promotional activities that, that we're looking for. Nike was a very, very small company at the time. They were the upstart. And I felt that they had the biggest need to do things that were sort of unconventional at the time. Like the idea, if you have to understand, back in 1984, the greatest players in the NBA, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Free Michael Jabbar, Moses Malone, none of them had their own shoe. And so the idea that you're going to have a shoe company manufacture an autographed shoe for an unproven rookie was unheard of. But I felt that, you know, I had a great relationship with Nike and I felt that they would work the hardest because they needed him the most. And the rest is history. Bueno, me dice que, o nos cuenta que Michael viene de una familia increíble, que trabajaban muy duro, sus padres lo empujaban para que tuviera un buen desempeño siempre y eran buenos modelos a seguir. Dice que pues tenía una preferencia Michael, como todos sabemos, por Adidas y esta compañía que del que él era representante era muy cercana con Adidas y pues tenían jugadores con ellos que tenían contratos con, con Adidas jugadores de tenis sobre todo y dice que eh, pues el dueño de Adidas murió a, en ese momento y pues la compañía no estaba como en una posición de promover actividades eh, que ellos buscaban, que ellos querían hacer con Michael Jordan y Nike por el contrario era una, una empresa muy pequeña pero podían hacer cosas que no eran convencionales en ese momento, digamos que en 1984 Magic Johnson, la Bird, esos grandes jugadores no tenían una línea de zapatos, entonces la idea que tuviera una compañía de zapatos era bastante única y pues él tenía una buena relación con Nike y sentía que esa compañía iba a trabajar duro para hacer lo que ellos necesitaban, el resto pues es historia. Ana, yo quiero preguntarle al señor Falk 
por otro protagonista de la historia y, y que siempre estuvo al lado de Michael Jordan y es eh, Scottie Pippen, su compañero de siempre en los Chicago Bulls para muchos, después de Michael, el mejor jugador de la NBA en, en ese momento. Eh, pero en el documental se dice, bueno, y, y se sabe que Scotty, para lo bueno que era, ganaba muy poco. Era un tipo que, que nunca fue apreciado, digamos, financieramente y, y, y en, en marketing eh, por su equipo. Él cree que quizás a Scotty Pippen le faltó eh, poder de negociación o ser más fuerte en, en la negociación para que lo hubieran apreciado de verdad eh, como la, eh, la calidad y la clase de, de jugador que era, que quizás se le faltó ser más fuerte en sus eh, negociaciones con los Bulls para, para de verdad que lo, lo valoraran por lo que era. Mr. Falk, let's speak about Scottie Pippen. For many people, he was the second most, imp um, most important player in the NBA um, in those 90s, in the 90s. Um, in the documentary, it is very well documented Excuse that me. he was It's under... Very hard. It's very hard to hear. No, no plays all oh. ears. Okay, it's, okay, it's, let, it's, me, let me try it's again. Echo. Okay, let yeah, me see speak, if I can turn let, my volume. Let, let, let's comment there. Okay. Um, let's speak about Scotty Pippen. Uh, for many people, he was the second most important player in the NBA. On the documentary, The Last Dance, it is documented how he was very underrated, how his salary was nothing compared to other players in the Chicago Bulls. Do you feel that Scotty was missing certain um, negotiation skills or that, he, or that he had to be, you know, stronger with them so that they would have valued him like he should have? Okay, it's a very good question. So first of all, I think Scotty Pippen was a very terrific complimentary player to Michael Jordan. I, I don't would not agree that he was the second most important player in the league by any stretch. Now when you have people like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, James Worthy, I mean, there are many, many great players. But when it comes to When it comes to talking about, when it comes to talking about his contract, if you recall in the documentary, Scotty mentioned that he had two members of his family living at his home who were in wheelchairs. And what Scotty was looking for was long-term financial security so that he could know that no matter what happened to him, he'd be able to take care of the people in his family. And so he decided to take a long-term contract that, that gave him security, but it didn't keep him in tune with, with financial changes in the marketplace. And that's, that was very common to many, many players during that period of time in the NBA. For example, Mag Magic Johnson, you know, signed a contract for 25 years for $25 million, which is a million dollars a year. And less than a year after he signed that contract, we signed a rookie named Patrick Ewing to a 10-year contract for $3.2 million a year. And so anytime a player decides he wants security, it has a price. And I think Scotty, you know, later in his career, signed a much bigger contract and and got the, you know, got the, 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 the financial reward that he was looking for. Bueno, nos cuenta que Scottie Pippen es un gran 
jugador complementario a Michael Jordan, no era el segundo mejor, estaban Larry Bird, James Ward y Magic Johnson también, pero cuando vamos a hablar de su contrato, eh, y si se recuerda bien el documental, eh, recuerda cómo Scotty contaba que dos miembros de su familia, eh, con, porque él vivía con ellos, eh, estaban en silla de ruedas, estaban en, en condición de discapacidad, y él quería por esto una seguridad financiera, y esto se lo permitía un contrato a largo plazo que le diera este tipo de seguridad, pero por el otro lado no lo mantenía actualizado con los cambios en el mercado, dice que es algo similar que le pare, que pasaba en a Magic Johnson porque pues era el común denominador en este momento con los jugadores y cuando una, un jugador en particular quiere una seguridad, eh, una estabilidad esto tiene un precio y pues eventualmente Scotty firmó uno mucho más ambicioso uno mejor y tuvo un reconocimiento financiero mejor que se merecía pues Craig, yo quiero pre seguirle preguntando sobre Scottie Pippen y su, y su labor, no solamente con el factor económico que no fue valorado, sino con su lugar en el equipo. ¿Cree él que hubiese sido posible para Michael Jordan ganar esos seis campeonatos si no hubiese tenido a Scottie Pippen a su lado? So, Mr. Falk, you know, you just told us about the contract fact about Scottie Pippen, but do you feel it would have been possible for Michael Jordan to win this six championships if he would have not had Scotty Pippen as his sidekick? No, I think, as Michael said on the documentary, Scotty was a great sidekick to Michael. He complimented Michael's game. He was a great defensive player. Um, and, and Michael did everything to support Scotty that he could. But I think that I think Michael, as, as terrific as Scotty was for Michael, I think that if you look at other players that came out in the same draft as Scotty Pippen, you had Kenny Smith. Scotty Pippen was the fifth. Scotty Pippen was the fifth pick. Kenny Smith from North Carolina was a great point guard who won three championships with Houston was the sixth pick. Kevin Johnson, who was an all-star in Phoenix, another great point guard, was the seventh pick. Reggie Miller, who was one of the greatest ever three-point shooters, was the 11th pick. And so, while I think Scotty was a great compliment to Michael, I think that Michael, as the greatest player of all time, could have been successful with any one of those other three players or, or others. I think he lifted, he lifted up the entire team. Bueno, nos cuenta que Michael dijo en el documental claramente que Scotty lo complementaba muy bien, era un gran jugador defensivo y Michael lo apoyó lo más que pudo e hicieron una gran dupla, pero dice que así sea Scotty muy magnífico para Michael o así lo haya sido, habían otros jugadores como Kenny Smith, Reggie Miller, que era un fantástico anotador de tres puntos, Michael eh, hubiese podido estar acompañado por estos otros jugadores y hubiese sido igual de exitoso para él, Michael Jordan fue, es el mejor jugador de todos los tiempos y se hubiese destacado con cualquiera que tuviese al lado Quiero ir a, a, al documental de Last Dance, porque me parece que es uno de los mejores documentales deportivos de la historia y, y, y dicen que todo este material estaba listo, que el documental se pudo hacer mucho tiempo antes, pero que Michael Jordan no había dado como la autorización y que esa autorización llega cuando se empieza a discutir que tal vez Michael Jordan no era el mejor de la historia, y que él pensó que ese era el momento, este era el momento para presentarlo y demostrar a, los, a las nuevas generaciones, como dice él, quién era Michael Jordan. ¿Es esa la verdad de la historia o cuál es la verdad de la historia de por qué hasta ahora, si se tenía el material, sale el documental? Let's speak about the documentary, The Last Dance, perhaps one of the best sports documentaries in history. Um, 
people are saying that this documentary could have been done a long time ago, that the material existed, but that Jordan hadn't given, you know, the full approval to actually authorize the documentary. That the moment he decided to do it was when people started to ask if Michael Jordan was really the best player in history. Is this true or what is the truth about why the documentary came out now and not years ago? I, I can answer that very simply. It was just a question of com of comfort level. Michael Michael is a very humble man, and while his accomplishments on the court are incredible, unlike a lot of younger players today who who, who promote themselves, Michael Michael doesn't feel the need you know, to, to, to promote himself. So, so he was aware that the film existed. He agreed to let the NBA take all of the film during the 97, 98 season. But he, you know, he just, he wasn't, he wasn't interested in, in promoting himself. But now that, you know, he's, you know, he's, 57 years old. I think he, you know, I think he felt more comfortable letting, letting the story come out. Bueno, nos cuenta que es por un nivel de, de comodidad también, porque Michael es muy humilde, dice que sus logros en la cancha son increíbles y hay muchos jugadores actualmente que buscan promoverse y destacarse y Michael no siente esa necesidad a los 57 años de, de promoverse y exaltarse. Él sabía que la película existía, sabía que lo estaban grabando durante esa temporada, pero simplemente pensó que este era el momento para que se saliera a la luz. Ana, por favor, pregúntele a nuestro invitado sobre una de las críticas que vimos en el documental se le hizo a Michael Jordan durante su carrera y tiene que ver con que él nunca quiso meterse en temas políticos, en temas espinosos de actualidad, que él más bien evitó ese, ese, esos temas. Sin embargo, vimos que en los últimos meses hizo una donación de cerca de 100 millones de dólares o la anunció para la lucha contra el racismo. ¿Por qué durante su actividad deportiva no quiso meterse en esos temas difíciles y ahora sí. Speaking about another subject that came up in the documentary, and it's that Michael Jordan never wanted to participate or give his opinion on political matters. And that it's, well, it's reported that in the last months he contributed $100 million to help fight racism. Why do you believe that during his career he, you know, uh, denied giving political comments, but now he's changing his, well, his way of acting? I, I didn't, you, you, you break, can't understand the question. Let, let me try again. During his career, Michael... Go ahead. During his career, Michael did not want to give public opinions about his political ideas or about any political matter happening in the country or in the world. In recent months, he contributed a hundred million dollars to Black Lives Matter. Why has he changed? Why now he's participating and giving his opinion on political subjects and he did not do it during his career? I think you have to remember, when Michael Jordan came into the league, he was 21 years old. And you have a different perspective in life when you're 21 versus when you're 57. And again, just like the question you asked earlier, you know, I told Michael when he was very young that the American dream is to work very hard at your job, become the best at what you do, and make a lot of money. And when you get that level of financial security, it gives you the option to do whatever gives you personal satisfaction. 
So while a lot of people felt that Michael should do more politically, it really wasn't their place to make that decision for him. And when he felt comfortable that it was appropriate for him to to publicly address charitable issues or political issues, he did. But you can't allow other people to make decisions for you. You know, Michael's a very intelligent man. And at the end of the day, he's got to make his own decisions after getting input from people that he would trust. Period. Bueno, hay que recordar que Michael Jordan llegó a la liga a los 21 años y a esa edad uno tiene una perspectiva muy distinta de la vida a la que tiene a los 57 años. Dice que le decía siempre Michael Jordan que el sueño americano era trabajar muy duro, trabajar muy duro en lo que uno hace, convertirse en el mejor, hacer mucho dinero y cuando se llega a ese nivel uno sí ya tiene la opción de hacer lo que le dé mayor satisfacción personal. Mucha gente pensó en ese momento que él debía ser más activo políticamente, pero ellos, él, para él ellos no eran quien para decirle a Michael Jordan eh, qué hacer o por qué deberían tomar esa decisión de ser mucho más activo, sino que era algo que él podía tomar una decisión que él debía tomar cuando se sintiera cómodo para hacerlo. Y pues, en su opinión, uno no puede permitir que las otras personas tomen ese tipo de elecciones por uno. Dice que Michael era muy inteligente y pues era absolutamente capaz de tomar sus propias decisiones. Ana, este documental ha despertado otra vez el viejo debate, el de siempre, de quién es el más grande de todos los tiempos. Para el señor Falco, obviamente es claro que es Michael Jordan, pero ya ha aparecido un nombre que es el de LeBron James. ¿El qué opina respecto a la, a la comparación con, con LeBron James y Michael Jordan? ¿Le parece que, que tiene asidero o que Jordan está muy, muy lejos de los demás? After this documentary, there's been a lot of talk about who's the biggest player in the history of time, who's the best player. Of course, we know that for you, that's going to be Michael Jordan. But the name that's been popping is LeBron James. How do you feel about the comparison between Michael Jordan and LeBron James? Do you feel it's a fair comparison or that Michael is way ahead of what LeBron James has uh, reached? Till now. Okay, first of all, I'm a big fan of LeBron James. I think he's a great player, and he'd be a great player in any era. Now, there's been many great players in the NBA. You've had Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, James Worthy, Moses Malone. Oscar Robertson, Jerry West, um, Kobe Bryant. Can you hear me? Sir, and, yes. And yes. so I, I think that I think it's impossible to compare players of different eras who play with different rules. But the bottom line is Michael Jordan won six championships. In six, in six attempts to win the championship. And I think until LeBron gets the six, that there's really nothing to talk about. And I really have to go. It's 45 minutes. He said 15. I've got a conference call in two minutes. So I've enjoyed it. And I appreciate uh, the chance to visit with the basketball fans in Colombia. And I wish that my Spanish were better, so I could do this interview in Spanish. Don't you worry. Uh, maybe just a last very quick question for our listening, uh, listeners in Spain. Do you have any opinion on Paul Gasol and the Gasol brothers? Yes. Do I, do I know them? I know them. I've never I, represented them. I'm, I think they're great. I think they're really good players, very skilled players. And I've had, a, you know, I think I think that they represent the influx of of European players into the NDA. Um, Mr. Fox, thank you, thank you very much for your time and congratulations on your very interesting career 
around the greatest NBA players in the history. Thank you so much. Augusto is mío. El gusto es mío. Sí, Ana, es que le dijeron que la entrevista era cinco minutos y ya llevaban 45, ¿no? Entonces, y encima de eso le hablan por dentro de un tubo, entonces, y encima de eso le hablan un poquito más rápido de lo normal, ¿no? Y lo que faltó. Perdón, eso es. No, pues. Eso, eso fue mi culpa. Es gran leyenda, que, sí, sí, sí. y qué documental. Eso sí es por, con el patrocinio de Félix de Bedut. ¿Qué dijo al final brevemente? Resumen ejecutivo, Ana. Dijo que era un fan Great. de LeBron James, que era un gran jugador y que hay muchos buenos jugadores en la NBA como Magic Johnson, Oscar Robinson, Terry West, Kobe Bryant, pero dice que no es justo comparar eh, los jugadores de diferentes tiempos que juegan con reglas distintas, que Michael Jordan ganó seis campeonatos en seis intentos y hasta que LeBron James no logre eso, no logre el sexto, no hay nada de qué hablar, quiere visitar a los fans del de básquet en Colombia, le gustaría haber hecho esta entrevista en español si tuviera mejor eh, español y sobre Paul Gasol dice que los conoce, no los ha representado cree que son buenos jugadores, tienen muchas habilidades y pues se representan a esos jugadores europeos que han llegado a la NBA Acompáñenos en el canal de YouTube arroba Julio Sánchez Cristo Oficial